So we were uh, yesterday, right? I was talking about the space invariant, space invariant, invariant case, which is which is of course simple, right? It's like your normal kind of a convolution, except that at the boundary. So I'll just I'll just tell you what uh, what I meant. See, you have something like this, right? This is your image, and I was telling that. Uh, or I was saying that. Okay, here is your image. And if you keep the kernel here, right at the boundary, so as long as uh, okay, let's say it's a it's a three cross three. Huh? This is your edge, which could have come from a Gaussian or a pill box or whatever. And uh, and if this guy sits inside, okay, then of course you don't have an issue. Here there is no issue, right? Because it sits fully this kernel. But when you go here, okay, it does not sit fully because then it'll come out like that. Okay. Uh, it will look like that. So now what happens is you have only four intensities to average, right? If you if you simply take, so if these are those four weights, okay, in this kernel, right, if these are those four weights, then what it will mean is you will simply do, you will simply add, I mean, you will simply weight each of these intensities below with that weight and add up. But then what can happen is because these, in, these weights won't sum up to one, because the entire thing will sum up to one, but not just uh, some isolated four weights, right? So, what will happen is if, let us say, assume that uh, that these values are all equal, 40, 40, 40, 40. Then if you just uh, just use this weighted average, then it will actually be less than 40, okay, which is which is not which is not because of uh, because of the blurring or anything. It is simply happening because of the fact that you are using under utilizing the weights, okay? So, that is why I said that you could normalize these weights at the boundary. So, you take these four, suppose they are either A, B, C, D, just add them up and then scale each, each one of them by, you know, A plus B plus C plus D. So that these sum up to one only at the boundary, and then you just apply it. Okay, just I mean, so there are ways, there are different ways to do it at the boundary. People don't worry so so much about what's happening at the at the, at the last row and the last column or last two rows and last two columns and so on because the rest of the image is still so very big, right? Looking at 1024 by 1024 or something, so two rows and two columns, we are not so bothered. But if you are if you are interested in what you could do, perhaps is Either you just, you just go with it as it is, but then that can reduce intensity. So instead, you could just renormalize the kernel only at the boundary. Okay, but don't but don't uh, don't use this elsewhere. Elsewhere, it will be the actual kernel. Only at the boundary, you just renormalize and use it. The other one is the space variant blurring. Okay, there is this is more uh, this is more tricky, and some people call it space variant convolution, but I don't know. Uh, see, convolution itself means like it should be invariant, like time invariant or space invariant, but this is a terminology that has come to be accepted. Some people say it is a space variant convolution, but we will simply say space variant blurring, okay. So here what happens is, you know, uh, we would like you to get a, get a feel for how an image would look if a camera, if the, if a, if the lens was looking at actually a 3D scene, okay. So, so you, have a, you, have a, you have a lens here, right, and then you want to understand what what will be the what might be the image formation now? How could this image be interpreted? Just like the image that I showed you yesterday, where there was a what is that? There was a rack, right? A book rack, and then the blur was kind of increasing, right? As you went backwards, so you want to understand. I mean, how this probably how this how this image formation is, prob is possibly happening? Only thing is this edge that you are taking. Okay, uh, normally when you synthesize, you will assume some edge. You will assume some simple model and do it. But in reality, right, H could be H could be something else. I mean, in the sense that it need not be strictly a Gaussian and so on. So we don't worry about finding the exact H for a lens because for every lens, H will keep changing. So we just assume that it can be reasonably modeled for the same reasons that I said yesterday. Right? You could you could model it as a Gaussian and come to some approximation as to what might be going on. But if somebody gave you the actual H, you could use that. Now in this case, right, because just to simplify matters, what we do is we will. Uh, uh, no, so here, right? What we will do is we will we actually give you give you a surface. See, what you need is okay. First of all, the point is because of the fact that the scene is 3D now, right? So uh, what it means is that every point, okay, is that is that uh, is that some z you know from the lens. So each has its own sort of a depth, right? So something is nearer, something is farther, and so on. And something could be at the plane of focus in the sense that some points could actually be coming into focus on the plane. So so in order to in order to kind of capture all of that, so what uh, so what we could what we do is the following: uh, we ask you to assume a Gaussian kernel everywhere. Okay, 
ask you to assume a, assume a Gaussian kernel at all the places and we give you uh, okay, we give you a distribution of the sigma over the image. So, if this is your image, assume that it is some phi 12 cross phi 12, okay, then we will give you, so actually what we do is we give you, uh, give you a sort of a Gaussian surface itself. The kernel is Gaussian is one thing, the surface also just for analytical ease, we give you a Gaussian surface which actually means that this surface, right, I mean if you try to plot this, it will look somewhat like that. So, we can, we can think of some kind of a dome, you know, that is kind of sitting and the camera is looking at this kind of a dome like structure. So, what, uh, so what we do is we actually give you an analytical function, which is simply a Gaussian actually, which will allow you to find out sigma at all places. So, it is like saying that, saying that, you know, you can find out sigma, <laughs> let us call this sigma 0, 0, you will be able to sign out sigma 0, 1. So, ideally, right, sigma can vary at every pixel now. Right? The earlier case was where sigma was a constant all over the image, right. So, there we had the same sigma wherever you go, therefore, we just use the same kernel, we said a convolution is fine. But now, what will happen is because of the fact that every point is at a different depth or can be at a different depth. So, and in this case, they are. So, we actually give you a distribution which you can calculate okay with some with some initial condition with some boundary conditions we give you so that you can actually find out what is the sigma at all the places can you make out when i write this huh, you can no so 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 you so you find out at all the places and now uh, now that you know the sigma map right so this is like your sigma map and it will have a resolution that will be identical to that of the actual image that you want to blur now now uh, shift invariance, right, will not hold because of the fact that things are at you know, uh, different depths. So, the only thing that you can exploit now is linearity, right, because the lens is still, still linear. So, like I told you, linearity is independent of, uh, right, we all know that, if of any space invariance and so on. So, if I have one point light source, right, with now, uh, you know, which sends out a certain sort of a blur circle, then I could have, I could have another point sending out its own, its own blur circle because it is at a different depth. And then superposition holds because the lens is linear. Therefore, all that we need to do is add them all up, right, on the say, image plane. So, so right, as you can guess, what would you do? So, you would actually, you would take up, uh, you know, you will take a grid like this, okay. If this is your output, G. In the earlier case, what we would have done is you would have just, you know, computed these convolutions locally, right, and, and simply, you know, you would have entered those values into this, this array, which gives you your output G. Now, you cannot, you cannot say do that anymore. You cannot do a local weighted averaging and all because the blur kernel itself is continuously changing. So, what would you do? You would actually find out that for this, uh, the, suppose let us say that I want to find out what I need to do here, somewhere here, okay. Let me just put that in some color. So, I want to want find out in the, in the output array, what should I enter there? So, what I would enter there is I will find out from my sigma map, okay, whatever is that value of uh, sigma here. Okay, because because I have this uh, sigma distribution, no. So I'll have a value for sigma there. Let us say that it's some two or something, just as an example. Then what I'll do, I'll find out an h for that two. So it'll be like c plus six sigma plus one. Okay, whatever. Oh, so you'll get uh, no sort of a thirteen plus thirteen kernel. So it'll go from minus six to six. So all those all those the HMN you will actually compute so that you get the whole kernel. Then what would you do? Just as you go back to that uh, to that equation, right, where we wrote g m n is double sum. F m prime n prime h m n semicolon m prime n prime, right, where it depends upon where your say, delta is getting applied. So, here this will equally mean that that kernel you should multiply with the with the intensity in the actual original image at that point. So, if let us say this is the sigma map and, and let us say you also have the image which is of the same size as this, correct. Imagine that your, your image is this, this is your focused image that you want to blur and of course, we will also give you the focused image because you need that to kind of right, create this blurring effect. So, at the same location you go here, right, at this location you have some f of whatever, right, you know, at this location, you know, let us say you have some intensity of 120, then 120 will multiply this kernel. So, you have this kernel that you have now, you see, now you have for that sigma, this is a 13 cross 13 kernel whose weights will sum up to 1, all of that it will follow. Now, you multiply this sigma, uh, not sigma, this intensity okay by this guy and then whatever so here you will get a 13 cross 13 grid right on the in, in the output array a 13 cross 13 uh, sub array you will get 
multiplied by 120. So, that will sit here. Okay, so, that will sit somewhere here as a 13 cross 13. Then you move to the move to the next pixel, let us say here. What should I do here? Now, again I will compute what is the sigma here. I will compute the kernel corresponding to that. I will multiply that kernel by the intensity here and then and then simply simply write and, and simply uh, simply uh, uh, what do you call it? you place that you place that at this at this particular location. So, what it will mean is you will keep on adding this array you know it is like saying that originally the, the array did not have any values at all all 0 then then you put one kernel right then you add with whatever was the right earlier array. So, you will have only like that kernel multiplied by that intensity then uh, then you then you then you put another kernel on top of that add it with the you know with the earlier result keep on doing this all over the image. So, this is simply the say linearity property you cannot use shift invariance because that would be then wrong. So, this is how you will have to generate uh, you know the entire entire sort of a blurred image. Do you have any doubt on this because this sometimes is a little confusing that is why I thought I will actually explain to you what, how it works. You see that right you cannot you cannot take this uh, right you cannot do a local averaging like we do in a sort of a convolution. So, all that we can do is you know treat as though each independent each point light source is independent and then see what it will shine on the right on the image plane what will it what will it is a result in and what it will say what it will give is simply the original focused image intensity at that point multiplied by that kernel. That is how we did no the blur circle and all that is how we, we came up with the, with the blur circle thing. Instead of a circle now it will be a kernel of a certain size and then has a distribution. Here we are assuming it to be a Gaussian and we are also telling you what that sigma is and in a real uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a real situation right this will all happen automatically. Right? So, the lens will have its own characteristics and then it will automatically do all of this and then what you see is finally a resultant image that you see is blurred space variantly and all that. Just that you can actually get a feel for it if you do it yourself. Hmm? Okay. Okay. Now, the point is at this point right we could switch to some other topic, but uh, but uh, you know but then the point is what I feel is having walked so much right in terms of how and you know, how the lens and you know, how the image is formed using a lens and so on. Having understood all of that right now is the right time to actually extend this idea a little further. Okay, one is to understand how this right image formation happens. And now, what basically one could do is one could now sort of right, play the other role in the sense that if I see a blurred image something like that right. So, so I mean here I have my image plane and then I see a kind of a, you know a blurred image there. Is there is there something right in that image that I can extract in order to be able to tell something about the scene now. See right now what we did was more like a forward problem. A forward problem is where you assume that 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 right a certain 3D scene exists you assume that uh, that there is a certain point spread function right that is uh, whatever in whatever form it is changing and then you say that for for this okay and for this imaging system what will be the output correct now a more interesting problem not that the other one is not interesting but you think a more you know interesting problem is if i showed you the blurred image okay you know is there a cue out there that you can use cue is like clue right is there a clue out there in that image that will actually tell you something about the scene itself so that's called an inverse problem Okay, and uh, inverse problems are always harder okay, because the forward problem is typically very very could I say well posed whereas you know inverse problem inverse problems are typically not really well posed. Okay. So, so a lot of effort has gone into this and lot of effort has gone into so you know so this whole area by the way right is called uh, comes under. So, this is really a vision kind of a problem uh, you know a computer vision problem, but since we are so close to this right I just thought you know. I, I feel it is interesting to just see how this can be applied applied uh, no, along the way. So, this is called shape, hmm? this whole area is called shape from x 